Good morning, Houston. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Ronnie Ricks, and uh, I'd like to introduce you guys to Tom Newley and his wife, Carol Newley. I'm going to share a little bit about them, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to them. Uh, Tom is one of the co-founders of the Pure and Simple Ministry, which focuses on helping men and women break free from sexual addiction and codependency. Tom started his first purity group in 2004, which has grown to, into several dozen groups, helping hundreds of men and women around the world. He also authored a book, Living Pure. It's a 42-day Bible study series, which contains the key lessons learned while working in the field of purity. Tom recently started Tom Newley Coaching. And I know many of you guys got our email, and it's on the website, so you can look at the website to get the, uh, the his web address. Uh, basically, this book, uh, which is a coaching business, specifically focused on helping people overcome unwanted sexual behaviors. Tom has worked in the full-time ministry since 1996 and currently leads the Madison Church of Christ. He is also a recovering alcoholic <clears throat> who has been sober for over 34 years. Um, Carol Newley started uh, the first known women's purity group in our fellowship. She has been instrumental in helping women overcome both purity and codependency issues uh, for 15 years. Carol has also done many purity codependency workshops in cities around the world from Chicago, Africa, San Antonio to New York and now Houston. Carol has worked in the full-time ministry for over 20 years and has also had an amazing impact around the world. One other thing before I, uh, we're going to pray and then I'm going to turn it over to Carol and Tom. For those in Houston, you guys know Charles and Dean Neely, and they share with us that they are very good friends with the Neelys. Actually, the Neelys were their very first discipling partners. So right now, we're going to open up with a prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tom and Carol. Let's pray, church. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity to give us every day to really uh, commune with you. Uh, you're such a great God, Father. There's no God like you, and I pray that as we... Uh, Spend a little time, Father, talking about purity and your word. Father, you will give Tom and Carol a lot of wisdom, uh, season their speech, God, and help our hearts to really connect uh, with your word and uh, just really your desire for your children. Father, we pray all of these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Tom? Good morning, Houston. We are so excited to be here this morning. Good morning. I just wanted to give you a, a thought about the first video. The title is called Pure Perspective. And the idea behind when we first started doing these groups years ago, there, was all, there were all kinds of problems in the church with sexual purity. When we finally uncovered how the problem really manifests itself and through the power of understanding God and God's word and where, where, how we're supposed to see it, it made all the difference in the world with men and women overcoming. And so this first video is designed to help you really start getting a grasp of what the problem is and where the hope really lies. Amen. Hello, Houston. Good morning, Houston. Greetings from Madison, Wisconsin. My name is Tom Newley. This is my wonderful wife, Carol. And uh, we, we lead, currently lead the Madison Church of Christ We've been in the ministry forever, 24 years to be exact, 16 years in Chicago, four years in Detroit, and now we've been here in Madison, Wisconsin for four years. We enjoy living here. We've got two kids. Our daughter is named Joy. She will be a senior at the University of Wisconsin. Go Badgers! And we have a son who is 17. He'll be a senior in high school. And we have a wonderful dog named Poe. <laughs> So years ago, uh, a really great friend of mine and I, we started a men's purity group, and uh, we, just, we just got together to help ourselves and help some other guys. The next thing we know, uh, it's 16 years later, and we have a worldwide purity ministry. God has just done amazing things as we really sought to devote ourselves to Him. In addition to the men's groups, I started a women's group for the wives who have the guys in the purity groups, and then really the women were realizing we they need a purity group as well. So I started a purity group in Chicago and a codependency group. 
And then even when we moved to the Detroit church, there was a need for a women's purity group. And here in Madison as well, I've got a purity group. And these groups consist of women who are in their teens, campus, singles, and married. Mm. So just to give perspective that it's definitely a need for the women too. And I'm seeing great victories of these women really getting free of sexual sin. Amen. Well, let's jump in. How do you feel when you discover that you've been deceived? I got a phone call 15 years ago. The lady on the phone said, congratulations, you've won. And I thought, okay, what have I won? And she said that you've won either a television set, you've won a new car, or you've won a vacation. Now, ordinarily, my radar would be up that this was some kind of scam, but I had, I had uh, about three weeks earlier, I had filled out a card at a drawing at Home Depot to win a new PT Cruiser. But she says, hey, she asked me, she said, hey, do you have an SUV? I said, no, I don't have an SUV. And she said, oh, that's okay. And I said, why did you ask? And she said, because if you win the television set, you're going to need something really big to carry it home. But she's like, that's okay. Just come on in and pick up your prize. It's going to be, we'll work all that out. So I get the address and get, the, get all the information, and we drive from the city of Chicago out to, the, out to the Chicago suburbs. I take a whole night off work. I'm thinking, man, I really wonder what kind of prize I get. When we finally get there, and they get us into the room where there's a whole bunch of other people there, and it turned out it was a timeshare presentation. Ah, oh, I was so, I was so like struggling. I had been deceived. And uh, I, you know, I felt angry. I wasted that time. I'm thinking to myself, am I the kind of guy that is just so easily tricked? But I was lured by something I wanted, a normal, I mean, these would be great things if somebody's giving away a free television or they're giving away a free car or something like that. I mean, gosh, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. But when I look back on it, I think to myself, I just didn't ask enough questions about what was going on. I didn't really find out about the company. I didn't really find out about the draw. I didn't really sit and think it through. In the end, we had to go through the whole timeshare presentation to get our prize. They gave us a coupon for a vacation a week away. And guess what? They never gave us the vacation. It was a total wash. And I just, that feeling of being deceived. Uh, for, all, for all of us, we're being approached by the sexual sin telemarketers of the spiritual world. And they can be very convincing, right? It could be worldly entertainment. It seems harmless to us, but really it's planting seeds of interest in immoral activity. Perhaps you're lonely and you, you, you just, you're like dying for a relationship. It can be very convincing. Boy, this, this type of activity, all oh, it would satisfy the loneliness of your soul. Maybe a door to sexuality was opened for you as a child, and you've just struggled ever since. And the telemarketers are always calling you, trying to get your attention. Perhaps you've had some kind of traumatic experience, maybe a divorce or something significant like that, and the telemarketers promise that you are going to get relief from your pain. Whatever the reason, it seems so justified at the time when we make the choice. It seems exciting and full of promise, maybe even even anonymity. We're here to share with you today that these, uh, these temptations and these things, are they're all from Satan. And the net result is destruction to our own lives. We start down of a path of seduction that seems full of promise, but in the end it damages us. It leaves us with shame, leaves us with scars, and potentially we can lose our whole relationship with God. What we want to do is we want to learn to ask more questions and the right questions about what we are doing. Perhaps the question isn't, how do I stop doing this? The question to ask is, what should I be learning from what's going on in my life? The world, and sometimes even the church, can be void of understanding of what to do with these powerful sins and temptations. Today's lesson is called Pure Perspective, and our desire is to pass on some of God's perspective of the world of sexual sin and temptation so that you can be clear-minded and properly guard your heart. Yes, there's a very real battle raging around us that just comes in subtle temptations, trying to pull us away. Uh, but I want you to understand, God is fully available. His promises to be able to be free of any kind of sin are 100% true. Today, let's explore the God's truths 
about sexual purity. Our first perspective is being connected to a dark world. You really want to understand this whole idea of sexual sin and temptation is a connection to a really deep and dark world. We're going to go through scriptures, Proverbs chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion, and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she's bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her steps lead straight to the grave. You know, sexual enticement really promises amazing pleasure. It sounds great, but it's really a deception. It's, an, it's a connection. It's a, it's a telemarketer trying to connect you and bind you to a very dark world. And ultimately, it leads to death. God is declaring. He's trying to get it out there. He's proclaiming to everybody, hey, listen, look at these temptations and realize that these things lead to death. And even though the scripture was talking about to their son, it's really a principle that applies to women as well. And I think about the first person, I think, in the Bible that we see who is deceived, and that's Eve. She was deceived by the, by the snake, by good-looking fruits that was going to taste good, give her wisdom, and she lost God's perspective and fell for Satan's perspective. And we know what happens in that story. She becomes um, full of shame and she hides from God. And I think about if she would have stayed on God's path in that moment, which, what life she would have had instead. But for all of us, we could be so deceived and starting in a very early age with romance novels or things we see on TV or even going to dance class and the attention that women get by using their bodies. Like it's from a very, very young age, we can be deceived into what the world wants us to become instead of what God wants us to become. And I think when we keep feeding the lies about that, we can get off track. Anyone can, um, especially with the internet now, even magazines, even the Hallmark Channel. You know, as Eve was cursed, God said that your desire will be for your husband. So even part of the curse was being wanting to be with her husband. I think we could start feeling like I'm not complete unless I have this relationship. And I think we're, we're also willing to compromise boundaries that we always said we weren't going to, so we would just to get the attention of a man. So there's so many things that can steer us off in the wrong, pers um, the wrong path. Also, many people with purity issues were sexually abused as a child. And that really does damage boundaries. I think we also know people who have left God for an ungodly relationship. But sexual sin, along with many other sins, is just, it's just trying to cover up pain and it's used as an escape. So the great news is that there's always hope and there's always help with God and that we could take the shame off and get God's perspective again. Now this, of course, does take hard work of self-awareness, going back to go forward. I know in our group, we talk a lot about boundaries. We talk a lot about resolving trauma and pain from our family of origins um, and connecting those dots to see where even today that there may be some perspective that is skewed, that is off, and how to get back walking, being our best for God. And the great news is God is there every step of the way and wants to give us a life of peace and freedom. Amen. Well, let's start asking ourselves a few questions just about this, this whole dark world that's out there. How does sexual impurity ultimately lead to death? Like, how does it exactly destroy our faith? It starts by creating pathways in our mind. Uh, pathways in our minds of pleasure. If you, if you look at neuro, uh, you do any kind of neuro studying, that kind of thing, uh, these, you, whatever you, whatever experience of pleasure you have in your mind, your brain does not have any kind of moral capacity 
to understand right and wrong at the time, like the way the, the, the way the actual science of your brain works. It goes straight to the pleasure and then it always remembers that pleasure. So whatever sexual, and you can't ever forget anything intentionally. So what happens is it begins to create a pathway to pleasure as a source of dealing with some kind of difficulty in our lives. Then we start relying on these experiences instead of God. Whatever difficulty we ultimately face in our lives, we're supposed to be able to bring that pain to find grace and mercy in our time of need before God. But you begin to see this pattern of, hey, I've got a, a quick, easy way to relieve myself of the pain that comes to all of us. The fruit of these actions, though, as I start building this pathway with my sexual pleasure, the fruit of these actions is initially guilt. Gosh, what I'm doing, I shouldn't be doing. Then it becomes shame, which is a not, it's not only guilt, but it's this idea that now I'm wrong. It literally attaches to your identity. It's guilt attached to your identity. It's shame about who you are. And ultimately, it can lead to a hardness of heart and a fading away of your faith in God. And then it can lead to a whole lifestyle of deceit where, what you're, where you just no longer really get open about the things that are going on in your life. If this, if this kind of situation is going on in your life or continues to go on in your life, uh, these are just the beginning of your problems. Eventually, if this goes undealt with, the long-term effect of it is uh, immaturity. So that the years you spend believing, you know, working at being a disciple, if you have this going on in the background, you don't ultimately become the person that God has called you to become. And you don't ultimately, you're, you're not ultimately able to fill the responsibilities that he wants you to fulfill. And oftentimes it just leaves us with a long-term sense of disappointment in the way that our lives have turned out. And the final stage, if it continues to go on, the final stage of this is you lose connection with the truth altogether. And you eventually, many people eventually just walk away from God. They give up and walk away from God. So it's so important to be able to understand, gosh, if I've got this in my life, I really need to, to figure this thing out. I've got to figure out what is God's will. Uh, for dealing with sexual sin and sexual temptation. Now, let me just give you even some truth about the sex industry. Uh, there's a, it's a demand that demand drives any industry, right? Why is Starbucks popular? Because people love coffee, but they also like going to the Starbucks. So they, it's the experience and demand. If people no longer like to do it, the Starbucks stores would all close. City after city around the demand, if the demand went away, uh, the business would go away. But there's an incredible demand inside of people for sexual intimacy and just intimacy in general that doesn't get met in a godly way in people's lives. And this drives a $12 billion industry. What opens the door to like this online dark world that's out there? There's really three things. It's availability, anonymity, and affordability. It's a, they all line up together to make it a real easy access for absolutely everyone to participate. Even now, uh, you know, the, as sad as it may be, kids who are preteens are able to uh, access some of the most erotic material, violent material, gang rape type things just by getting onto Google when nobody's watching. There's 28 billion visits to a website called Pornhub. It's the number one porn site in the world. And there's 28 billion visits a year. That's enough for four times for every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. There, this, our world has become this incredible consumer of explicit content. I would say it's a, a time unlike any other time in history because of the amount of access that people have. So our society is filled with all this private sexual imagery in its in, inner world. It starts out with lust, which is a form of emptiness, but what really gets the appeal is the idea of control. And not only is it a pleasurable sexual experience, but it's the control that you get to have in, in addition. It's a, it's a selfishness mixed in with something great that God's given us. So it's essentially the lure of 
being like God, that you can do what you want and have what you want and have no accountability for it. Ultimately, this is what leads people into an addiction. And they continue to go down that road. And of course, whatever you do that's immoral never satisfies. And there's an increasing desire for more. And there's an increasing desire for perversion. That's why, that's why people who get addicted, they, they move towards increasing levels of things that appear ugly that initially they would have never even thought about. But it's the process of what's going on. And just so you know, the sex industry knows all of these things and targets our hearts to take our pain to them and then ultimately take our entire lives and our souls to them as well. And they're experts at being able to fish people in. Now, just so you know, all the people who perform in the sexual industry, you, they're deceived and exploited people, both men and women alike. Many perform under the threat of coercion or violence or defeat a drug habit. Many are underage. Uh, right, the, the child pornography industry is increasing at rates that it's never that, that we've never seen in the history of this country. Um, but and anyone who performs in this stuff, you know, even if there's a seemingly willing participation, they're exploited spiritually. Something's damaged inside there where they've lost hope in their own lives. And for us to watch it or participate in it, and just to think of it as just, oh, this is just a casual consumer product. We are actually willingly participating in the exploitation of people, especially women. And so many of the, the ideas in the, in the industry is around the violence towards women, that men can take their anger out by going and having somebody else be the scapegoat for our anger. Somebody else is going to be the victim because I don't want to deal with my pain in a righteous way. Make no mistake, though our battle is between our, our, our success with God, comes it's our responsibility. All of us are being pressured by this industry. Uh, it, it is different. And as time has gone on, all of us, our children, every last one of us is being pressured to normalize really sinful behavior uh, in our own minds. So unless you take full responsibility for your purity before God and really get your standards and your ideas and your power to deal with it and really have God's hand involved in your understanding of sex and sexuality, brothers and sisters, you will, by default, get connected to this dark world. Now, that's a tough perspective. Next perspective, this is a little bit better. We're, we're going from challenging up. <laughs> Our second perspective is that sexual sin is actually God's loudspeaker. If you have sexual sin in your life as a Christian, God is communicating something to you. Right? You know it's wrong, even condemnable, but gosh, is there, right? you know, it's like, why am I doing this? I know it's wrong, right? I think of the, uh, you know, the scripture, not even a hint, but why do I keep doing this? The question you should be asking is, uh, what's wrong? What is wrong with my spiritual life that I'm not finding the answer to the promise in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, where it says, you know, this is the victory in Christ to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome. Why is that not the reality in my life? I had a brother who came to me one time after a church event and he'd been struggling with impurity and sexual sin for 30 years. In fact, uh, in the 80s, he had gotten taken out of the ministry because of this very sin. And in tears, he was talking to me after the event out at a park. And he was saying to me, he's like, man, if I could just get six months. He's like, man, that would be the dream. And he was just even pleading with me, is there something wrong with me? Why can't I overcome this? And I'm going to get back to him and his story in just a minute. But sexual sin is God's loudspeaker. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 25. Let's go there. The Bible says, and it, it explains really what's going on. The question isn't, how do I get past this? The question is, boy, what is God communicating to me? And what should I be learning? Romans 1, verse 21 says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, just a an explanation of the context here. Paul is explaining and making, he's reasoning why human beings abandon God. 
So although they know God, they don't glorify him as God or give thanks to him, but their thinking becomes darkened. Although they claim to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. So sexual sin is a conundrum, right? We know we need to change, but we cannot. What's the problem? And he, in this passage, he says, gosh, when we are missing the singular focus on God, when we are missing uh, the, the kind of appreciation, the singular appreciation for who God's goodness, all that God has done, God's, and we fail to become the people spiritually that God is planning for us to become, he turns us over to our sexual sin. It's actually when we don't, when we're not on the path that he wants us to become, he's like, okay, you don't want that path, then you can have this path. I'll just, I'll let you have what you really want. And it's God's way of communicating, hey, there's something not right. So if you're, if you're in this particular sin, or you know somebody who's got problems with this and it's a continued cycle, then what, what is God communicating? He's saying, gosh, there's something wrong in the way that you are pursuing a relationship with him. There's many people, certainly people in the world don't really understand these things, but there's many people even in our church uh, who do not have, nor are they developing the kind of relationship, the surrendered relationship with God that he desires and he expects out of us. So that's kind of an interesting, let me, let me try to expound on that a little bit. What do I mean by their problem as a relationship with God? How are you doing at relying on God's power for victory? The idea is that, the idea is that we don't use our own power, our willpower, to overcome sexual sin. We learn to rely on God's power to help us through each temptation, one temptation at a time. Have you admitted to your powerlessness, right? Where you, where you see, gosh, I can't do this on my own. As much as I'd like to do it on my own, I can't do it on my own. Do you have a great deal of self-reliance in your life? Typically, people who are struggling with these kinds of challenges, there, there's a whole self-reliance piece to their lives that God is trying to expose. How about how are you doing at being open? Hey, nobody, uh, I, I don't know any guy or any woman that really likes to be open about their struggles with sex and sexuality or their sexual sin. In fact, I can think of many guys who just put it off forever before they finally started talking about it. Or guys who sat in the parking lot before their first meeting just sweating bullets, oh, I don't want to be a guy who has to go to the purity group. It's a, there's shame, there's a, there's a wall of shame that God wants us to go through in admitting to who we really are. So that he, he's ultimately the one who gets glory and credit for our lives, for the success in our lives, for who we are as Christians. However, we have to see who we really are. And if you're not open regularly, and you don't really even want that kind of lifestyle, you're just not gonna be successful at overcoming these kinds of very intimate challenges within your life. Um, and I get it. I, I never wanted to be the open guy. I wanted to be the champion guy. I wanted to be the victorious guy, not the humble, open, vulnerable with my sin guy. But God had different ideas. And until then, eventually he got his point across to me as he's got his point across to many, many other people as well. But how are you doing? Another question. How are you doing at your just your daily engagement with life? Many times I could get psyched up, hey, I'm gonna be different this time, I'm gonna change. But you know, our emotions are powerful, powerful influencers. And I didn't even realize what kind of cycles I was in where I would get my feelings hurt or I would feel discouraged or I would feel uh, ashamed of who I was. And those, those, very those very feelings would completely shut down my engagement with God. And I had no tools in place and no friends in place to be able to be open about these kinds of, about my emotions and deal with them and respond to them and, and feel God's gentle kindness and 
helping me through it and the healing through it so that I could stay consistently engaged with God. So I would shut down my engagement and then I would act out again. And I've seen it happen just over and over and over in guys' lives. And then the net result of that is they think the problem is sexual sin, but in reality, the problem is they don't deal with their inner world. Their inner world is completely, they're completely oblivious to it. Though that is where God wants us to go and to get, uh, get help. Remember Jesus rebuking the Pharisees. He said, clean the inside of the dish. The solution is in the inside of the dish. There's answers in there if we're willing to go. But for our own good, uh, God is alerting to you and me. He's alerting to us our spiritual immaturity. Right? That doesn't at all excuse our sin. Like, oh, well, you know, God's trying to say something to me so I can do whatever I want. No, it's just the other way around. He's saying, hey, listen, you're, you want to start going down that road of admitting that you are powerless. Well, what happened to the brother that I mentioned before? Well, he, he got a hold of these ideas, and he actually got a hold of them fairly quickly. And he stopped acting out altogether. When he initially approached me, he said, do I have to tell my wife? I don't want to tell my wife. And I said, well, you know, I'm not going to make you tell your wife, but as you start like living a life of openness, you're probably going to want to tell her and you're going to want to get healing in your marriage. Ultimately, maybe it was two months later, he told his wife everything, where he'd been at, all these things. Now that same brother has, uh, I believe it's 11 years without acting out, without any pornography or masturbation that he was enslaved into for 30 years. He calls me every year on his anniversary. Hey, I just want to let you know it's another year. I got another year free. I'm so grateful to God for his amazing power at setting me free. And it really is not a testimony to me. It's, a, it's God. God, when we really submit to him, he opens this kind of door. Um, but he finally heard, this brother finally heard God's loudspeaker and it clicked and boy, his life has been changed ever since. Well, let's go to the last perspective. Uh, there is ridiculous, ridiculous hope. Did I say there's ridiculous hope? There's tons of hope. Now, you may not feel it. You may not have experienced it. You may have trouble believing it. But God's word promises it. We built our ministry on this particular promise. It, that Just the whole idea that this, if it's really true, because it's God's word, we just have got to believe it. And if, if we're not seeing it in our lives, that means we something's not right with us as opposed to it's not true. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, if you could turn there in your Bible, the Bible says, uh, this is Peter speaking, he says, His divine power, referring to God's divine power, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, referring to the glory and goodness, the glory and goodness of God, through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Listen, it's what this is essentially saying is that everything we need to be victorious is given to us through God's glory, goodness, promises. Everything is given to us. Now, this is good news and bad news. The good news is, man, God promises there's to be victory in our lives. The bad news is, if I don't have the victory, then that means I have to change. It's not my circumstances. It's not my situation. It's not the sex industry that rages around us. The issue is with me. I really believe this particular promise is the second greatest promise in the Bible. First one being salvation, redemption, going to heaven. And this is the, ne this is the part of that redemption promise where we can change and ultimately have our lives transformed to be like Jesus. Carol and I have literally seen hundreds of men, hundreds and hundreds of men and women all over the world uh, overcome and go from fringe people in the church to leaders. Go from single, thinking they would never be able to get married, to getting married. But more importantly, they went from people who are not really men and women not mature men and women of God to becoming the mature people in Christ that they wanted to become. When people finally get the message from God that in order for life to work correctly, God's got to be first over all manners of self. When God sees pe and then when God sees people pursuing Him in that way, He's just like the God, the Father, in the parable of the prodigal son. He's He's He just 
like loses, I mean, he just starts running towards you saying, welcome back, welcome back. This is exactly what I'm looking for. Well, guys, let's wrap it up. Let's wrap up the first session. I was lured uh, into a timeshare presentation because I was excited about a reward, but I failed to ask the questions to get the perspective. And in the end, I was like, oh, so upset. I felt bad about myself. Sexual sin does the same. It promises everything, but delivers nothing. Remember, when it comes to knock, when it comes knocking, sexual sin comes knocking, to ask the world, hey, gosh, what am I connecting to? What am I going to be? What, I mean, what, I don't want to be a part of this. What's, a, what, what's this going to do to my spiritual life? Who can I possibly talk to about these things? Whenever you talk to other people about it, it's like the deception goes away. Why has giving up hope seemed like a good choice? That's a terrible choice. Brothers and sisters, get your questions answered. Speak to someone you trust before you make a decision that you could possibly regret for eternity. Remember, God is doing everything he possibly can to rescue you and me from the pressure of evil that we might be the men and women of God living in freedom who can turn around and rescue others. Thank you very much. Amen. Hello, Houston. I hope you enjoyed the message. I hope it was uh, useful and inspiring. Um, I did want to give you a couple thoughts, just to uh, house before we before we jump into the questions. Uh, I wanted to mention if uh, if you want to know anything more about the Tom Newley coaching, you can go to the sponsor tab. It's one of the it's. Uh, on that tab, they'll have a number of different websites you can go to. But out on that website, you'll learn all about uh, the coaching business I started. It was mainly to raise money to be able to put people into the full-time ministry. I was trying to come up with a creative way to be able to help that cause here in our own Madison Church of Christ. Uh, also, if you're looking for books, there are resources under the, I believe it's the resources tab. Uh, I've got a book out there. The Wideners have books. There's several books out there that are hopefully useful and uh, worthwhile. Also on the chat, if uh, you know you have any questions, just put those questions into the chat, and then uh, we can even answer some of those questions live during our next lesson. Uh, but those questions are being queued up for us, and we're going to start going through those questions right now. Our first question is. Um, let's see what we've got. What about recurring impure thoughts and images in our own mind? What do you suggest if they keep coming back? Uh, there's a couple, I mean, there's, there's a few different ways to think about it. I think one is to have a patient mentality towards ourselves. Uh, we are sexual beings and sex is a gift given to us by God to help create, to, to create an, you know, uh, a godly unity within our marriage. And so God put a powerfully strong desire inside of us uh, that, so things keep coming up. And so there's a, there's a patience with it. There's a gentle surrendering of those thoughts and images. And uh, at the same time, there's a going to God, just even like the lesson uh, where I talked about the problem isn't uh, the, the problem really centers around our ability to not rely on our own power, but rather to rely on God's power. And uh, what we wanna do even with the images is to recognize that we're powerless over these thoughts that come up inside of our minds and to really appeal to God for his power to gain strength in that area. And just to add, this past Thursday night, I have a women's purity group and what my lesson was on our being pure in our thoughts and we talked about how when thoughts come in, sometimes we let them in and we just got to let them right, go right on out again. Um, and we, we just know Satan's got all these schemes and wants to discourage us. So it's good that we see that as sometimes just straight from Satan. Also, it's that scripture in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, where we take captive of every thought. So we want to make it like a prisoner. And then what are we going to do with it? We're going to let it go. We're going to release it. And, um, and we're not going to let it reign in our hearts. 
And also the next part of that, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And so what does that look like? And that's where we really talked about making sure we are being yoked with Christ. And so when those thoughts do come in from our past, um, yeah, it's so important that we just immediately, we don't obsess over it, but we take it captive and then we make it obedient to Christ and we really rely on Jesus and pray during those times. I think it's also why we really stress so much at a young age, don't put, don't watch terrible things. Don't um, look at pornography and the like, because wow, it's, we have our thought life that sometimes it really can get embedded. And then also replacing those bad thoughts with good thoughts. You know, what are some of the good things we can do? And just really clinging to God's word and to Jesus's promise in the scriptures. Amen. Um, next question. How do we protect our kids from sexually explicit content? but also ensure that they have proper knowledge of sex and reproductive health. How do you feel about the education system on this topic? Okay, how do we protect our kids? Uh, we're gonna talk about that in our third class, the class that begins at noon. Uh, we're gonna, oh, can, we'll, oh, we'll get so to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we'll, so we'll talk about that in our class at noon and we'll get into a lot of details about how to protect them. Uh, as far as how do you have, help them have a proper knowledge of sex and reproductive health, really as a Christian parent, we want to take responsibility and do everything we can to educate our kids. Uh, for us, we spent uh, the time, we would read books with our kids when they were young. There's books that you can, at every age group, that you can read with your children, and you're trying to create a dialogue where you become the source of authority about sexuality for your children. They're gonna go into the world, the world's gonna, it's gonna attack them. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, but we're gonna to try to set ourselves up. We tried to set ourselves up to be able to have that kind of communication. How do I feel about the education system on this topic? Uh, boy, you, there's, there's a lot to say, but I don't feel very good about any of it. <laughs> um, just, the way they treat sex and the way sex is uh, explained, uh, it's because it's not explained through the paradigms of the Bible and through the instructions of God. And as God is the source, uh, I'm not a fan. And I think those books that we read for our kids, it's called God's Design for Sex. And it's really about, you know, it's, it portrays it beautifully. So for us as the parents to have the authority on it versus going to school and learning about it um, is really important. And we do talk about that in our third, third video, uh -huh. third video today. Carol, for you. All right. How, um, let's see. How have you gotten single women and married women to address purity in groups? Can you comment on the status of women and sexual purity? Do they have issues with porn, et cetera? Yeah. Um, for sure, in all my groups, you know, I've got everybody's in there, you know, teens to marrieds, and it's it is an issue. And again, it's laying down once we have bad habits going on, it can really stick even into our married life. But um, for sure, I think it takes a lot of time for the sisters to be open sometimes. And it really takes that one person to be open. So there's times where if I know someone's background, I will I will definitely say, hey, would you be willing to share um, and share, gosh, we, do, we journal out sometimes our history and that kind of helps other people get open. Um, so yeah, women too. And it's, there's all sorts of stats where we're, <clears throat> women are looking at porn just about the same level now as men are. And it's always been, I think, a women's problem um, issue as well. So in the church, even, we still think it's just the guys, just the guys need the group. And that's just really not true. I do think that women carry a lot more shame along this line. So um, for women to be able to be vulnerable, and I, I, they're heroic, the women who are willing to use their stories to help others and open up that can of worms is, is a great blessing. Um, because it does, I find in my purity groups, it, it, this is a third church I started one in. And it takes a while to get the sisters to be open um, and vulnerable. I speak a lot about vulnerability, a lot about getting the shame off and getting the help so we can live the free lives that God wants us to live. Right. Right, you know, as I answer that. Yep. 
Uh, next question. Purity seems to be a lot about what not to do for single people. What are some positive things we can do with sexual desire? I think, um, you know, that's a, that's a great question. I think it starts with just having a positive idea or I, positive understanding even of the purpose of sex and sexuality, that it's a, it's a very important gift. I, that's how I think of it. I think of it like a gift. If my gift is singing, then when I sing for, and my gift is not singing, by the way. In fact, I won't even give you a taste. And Carol is uh, agreeing with me. Appreciate that, Carol. Okay. But uh, if my gift is singing and I'm singing for God, there's a satisfaction both for me and for God. And so just even knowing the ideal and praying for the ideal, if you're single, that the I, that you're, you desire to be able to use this gift within the context of marriage in God's way to create unity in your marriage is a great, it's just a positive way to look at it. In the meantime, it is a, it is somewhat of, gosh, what not to do. Uh, that there, there is that battle that's going to go on inside of you. And it actually, another positive way to look at it is, it is an opportunity to be able to learn to look to God for his help. Oftentimes when we, when we suffer in some way, whether it's something we want, we hit a wall. Uh, it turns into the very thing that enables me to humble myself before God in a deep and meaningful way. And not only once in a while, but to a deep and meaningful way consistently. Um, but yet, I, I, I know the challenge to it, but it's those are some of the positives that I, I find that even this whole battle with sexual sin and, sexu and battle for sexual purity uh, manifests itself. How do you, did you want to answer that? Okay. How do you stay consistent in confession and connecting with God? Um, there's a number of different ways, even back to even looking at the battle with sexual sin. I really believe for people, this particular weakness is designed to help us understand uh, how badly we need God's power to operate within our lives. And so initially we, we find, I can remember when I was a young disciple, and I've seen it with many other brothers and sisters within the church, they learn this idea of confession, and they get open about their sin, and they get open about their sexual, whatever sec, unwanted sexual behavior that they've done, and they immediately feel better about that. And then time goes on, and they drift away, and they go back and they get into something and then they come back and they go through that cycle for a while. The way that the thing that I underestimated and other people underestimated is the level of humility that God wants to train us into. He wants to lead us into a lifestyle of just high level humility where openness is something that we do regularly. A couple practicals are if you don't have a group, to find somebody as a check-in partner, where what you end up doing is instead of even being open about the things that you fell into, you end up learning a lifestyle of checking in on a daily basis. I think also uh, another way, if you do have a group, I don't know if Houston has groups or groups, purity groups. It's amazing when a group is going well because everybody is into the honest battle for our purity for the sake of the glory of God. And then we're able to talk. We're just able to talk about what's going on in the week, what's going on in the day. And we have friends and there's a, there's a real camaraderie built in the group around the battle for God's glory in this area. But those are, those are a couple ways from check-in partners to groups. I think to really meditate on the word as well mm -hmm. and have some battle cry scriptures, I call them, when you're in that battle. I think about, um, you know, prepare your mind for action, be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed from 1 Peter 1. Or, of course, you know, Ephesians, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, Ephesians 6. But just, yeah, clinging to the good 
and getting rid of the um, the old ways of doing things, but being renewed by our mind. And that's every day, daily making that decision. God, help me be pure just for today. Gotcha. Uh, the next question, is it harmful for married individuals to have sexual thoughts about each other? I think no. I think that's great that we think about each other and think about each other sexually. Uh, what about self-pleasure with thoughts of your spouse? So what about masturbation uh, with thoughts about your spouse? Where is the line? I really believe sexually, um, if I'm satisfying myself, sex is not a a solo operation. Sex is, uh, yeah, God, made, <laughs> God made sex to be between husband and wife. Uh, and so I, I think if I'm in the place where I'm gratifying myself, it's really a, there's, there's some element of selfishness there. Uh, oftentimes within sex and marriage, there is a loss of desire but most of the time, that loss of desire has to do with other relationship issues that are going on that need to be addressed also. So uh, anyway, that's my thought on that. Carol? Yeah, I think just to add, you know, we do know that when you masturbate, it can wreck your future sexual relationship with the spouse, and it certainly can damage your relationship um, with your spouse. So I don't think it's beneficial really in any way to go along with Tom. I think what you want to do is really work on your relationship within your marriage. Yeah. I can, I can see the reasoning because there's a strong desire and you're trying to stay, you want some kind of release. I think where we've got to go to that place where we're saying, gosh, how do I glorify God? And there's times where uh, I just have had to have be trained that I don't always get to satisfy. I mean, I don't get to satisfy myself when I want to. My, our relationship, our sexual relationship is satisfied when God blesses it. And it's just a different mindset as opposed to the reasoning, gosh, I'm really building up here. I have no outlet. What do I do with that? Those are the things that we take to God. Those are, there's also other things that are going on inside of us when those kinds of buildups are taking place. All righty, we got a couple minutes left. <clears throat> um, you can... All righty, you know what guys? Uh, I got the word from Jason. Jason Henderson is He's running. Awesome. He is amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh, this guy is a tech guru. He trains us, he, he makes us, uh, I don't know. He, he just even enables this whole thing to happen. Uh, let's give a great round of applause for Jason Henderson. Hey, there you go. <laughs> All righty, guys, we will be back at 11 o'clock for our next video. Have a great break. Get some coffee. Have a snack. Have lunch. Anyway, right. we'll see you in a bit. Bye-bye. Hello. Guys, we're in our second lesson and uh, really grateful this morning. Grateful to be together. But Houston, we have a problem. But Houston, we have a solution. All right, let's go. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> Just to recap the last lesson, pure perspective. It provides some of the big picture thinking around the issue of sexual sin and temptation. The Bible is loud and clear that we are to live sexually pure lives. However, a way to even think about it is God permits what he hates to accomplish in us that which he loves. For those of us to, who wish to overcome, there's all the power in the world to overcome. And God is putting that message out there. So let's dig into the lesson here. What does it mean to be enslaved to sin? We see that term in the, in the Bible, that at once we were slaves to sin. And certainly when it comes to sexual sin, we can feel as though we're enslaved to sexual sin. The Bible uses the term enslaved and the world, they have identified the problem and they use the term addiction. It's the same term, or it's the same meaning, just different term. But the definition of a slave is someone who is owned by another and forced to obey. 
So to be enslaved to sexual sin or sexual behaviors is a state where you just cannot stop permanently. You're enslaved to obeying the, the, the sin. Uh, so <clears throat> it's total insanity because we all know what the Bible says, right? Not even a hint. You know, of this you can be sure that no immoral, impure person has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. But yet the sin continues to be, to go through, to exist in our lives or in the lives of people we know. And we, we think to ourselves, gosh, we just need to stop or they just need to stop. It's, this doesn't make any sense. Now, just admitting to this condition is super hard. It's super hard to admit to because when someone is stuck, they just naturally think if they tried harder or they had more prayers or they got more serious, this problem would go away. But the reality is that person's will has already been compromised and the best efforts of their own power is not going to be able to set them free. You lose the power of choice once you start to indulge. So I'm not addicted to heroin, but, and so I can say, no, I, I'm not even tempted by heroin. But if I started using heroin, I would get addicted quickly and then my power of choice would be gone. So the, the power of choice is compromised once you start going down that road. This is why the world calls an addiction a disease. You may have heard that addiction is considered a disease. Uh, it's because scientifically they can recognize the powerlessness on the part of the person who's addicted. So now how do you know if you're enslaved? Well, you can get online and take a 20 question test That'll give you some insight into the issue. Or you can even do the simple one th this morning. Uh, the quick but accurate test is simply stop and stay stopped, right? Because we know what the Bible says. So if, we, if we're not enslaved, we can simply stop and stay stopped and go on with our lives of obedience to God. Uh, but most people, the, the truth is, most people play around with their willpower because they just want to avoid the shame of having to be open about this being in their lives, right? Nobody wants to be the person who's got to be open about sexual sin. All other sins, uh, there's, a, there's a certain shame in confessing them, but there seems to be an extra measure of shame surrounding sexual sin. Some people spend years resisting the admission of their powerlessness. I know a brother talked about wrestling with his, his, this particular addiction for 40 years just trying everything he could except for just coming to terms with his powerlessness. But here's the key. A person has to get to that moment of truth when they realize that they don't have control over it, but rather that sin has control over them. Does the Bible even, does the Bible recognize powerlessness? You know, they, let's go to Romans chapter 7, verse 19 through 25. As you're turning in your Bible, uh, just the idea of this passage, this is not Paul struggling with a personal sin. This is Paul doing a theological treatise. He's explaining theologically what goes on in the life of a, of a human being and how it relates to this idea of sin and their relationship with God. We're going to start in verse 19 where he says, For I, know the good, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of sin. Right? This is a condition. He's, he's revealing the condition of people. Is that we all have sins that we just, no matter how hard we try on our own, we can't get rid of. And sometimes we get duped because some seem to not, we can just say no to them and they go away. But sexual sin in particular for men and women is just super powerful in its ability to stay present in our lives. But who's going to rescue us from this body of death? It's going to be Jesus. Jesus himself is going to rescue us. Now someone who's in that good, humble starting place, they're like, I just need help. Somebody tell me what to do. Where should I go? How do I 
find, how do I find God to help me with this? That person is in the ideal place to start finding God's power. Now we know, just to, just to clarify something about repentance from the Bible, we know what the Bible says to repent of sin. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 11. Uh, I'm not going to read it, but where Paul says, essentially, hey, see what earnestness, what eagerness, what indignation. And there, it seems to insist on an immediate change of behavior. The reality is repentance is a, a change of our heart and a change of our mind, but sometimes the behavior needs to, it takes a while before it can actually change. I would even submit to you that there's another way to think of repentance, an additional way to think of repentance, that it comes in the process of maturing, where we, as we grow in God, we have a deep heart change that takes place and sin fades away. Well, brothers and sisters, that was a long introduction, but this lesson is entitled Pure Power. It's really the nuts and bolts of God saving us from our sexual sin. Um, I, I can think of a brother, a uh, great friend of mine, he wrestled around when he finally got to that place where he started admitting that he couldn't handle it. He went from being a fringe guy in the church, actually he and his wife were both involved in a bunch of things, and uh, he had been rebuked many, many times by people, well-meaning people, who are trying to almost like drive the demon out of him, uh, but not to much luck. And he was a fringe, lived to really kind of existed on the fringe of the church, debating on a daily basis whether he should stay or go. When he finally got this idea of powerlessness and started tapping into God's power, it was amazing the transformation. He started leading purity groups, started leading house churches. He ended up preaching on Sundays and just it has done an amazing job being a man of impact for God. So as we continue, let's look at a few basics of what it's going to take to access God's power. The first one is a mindset of training. Point number one is a mindset of training. Right? How do top athletes get strong or get fit? They train. And they don't just train. They don't just go to the gym a couple times a week. These guys train. They're, they're like into it. They train with others. They get coaches. They do everything they can to learn to be there in their best shape so that they can perform well. They forsake all kinds of other activities just so that they can train. Anyone that's powerful in anything, or anyone who's powerful in anything, gets that way through careful and thorough training. People who are victorious in this battle with sexual purity are people who surrender to a mindset of training. And uh, they're the consistent spiritual training. 1 Timothy 4, 7-8 through 8 says, Have nothing to do with godless myths or old wives' tales. Rather, train yourselves to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Paul is saying to Timothy, train yourself. This means it's your responsibility to change and do the work. Now, we know as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. However, at the end of the day, the training responsibility is on the individual to go and participate in ways to help them change. Hebrews 5 verse 14 also echoes this same message. It says, solid food is for the mature who constant, through constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. People who overcome consistently work at being mature spiritually. There's nothing necessarily immediate here, but their goal is to be holy like our God. Their goal is to connect with and live in the goodness that is fundamentally and intrinsically God. In order to attain, but in order to attain, attain that goal, training is required. Pimp people simply do not find extended victory without accepting a training mindset. And uh, sexual temptation is every day, and training needs to be every day. Thank you. I really think a big piece of training for our minds is simply contentment. The word contentment means a satisfied mind. And it takes a warrior spirit to be content. It takes a warrior spirit to be happy for sure. And being happy in our present days is super important. You know, during this pandemic and just the racial uh, tension in our country, it's really brought up a lot of stress and angst and pain for all of us. And it's really put a lot of burden on me and I'm sure you as well. 
And I really found myself giving my burdens to God every day mm -hmm. and even writing out my burdens, my burdens, my burdens. And just starting September 1st, I decided, you know, instead of writing my burdens, I'm going to start writing a gratitude list again. And I'm sure we've all done that throughout the years. We really know how great it is to be thankful and what that does for our spirits. But I started writing a gratitude list out every day and it's really changed my mindset back to being grateful and being uh, peaceful. And I've been meditating on the scripture from Colossians 3.15 which says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. And really trying to let the, the spirit of Christ rule my heart, the peace of Christ rule my heart being thankful and that's really helped my mind get back into training to be content to be satisfied you know the opposite of contentment is fantasy when we're not content we start having fantasies of oh I wish this could be better I wish that could be better what if this we even you know we start thinking about relationships we'd rather have even if we have a relationship we could think about oh if only my husband would do something different we start having fantasy about our how our life could be and maybe we want more attention maybe we want more intimacy so we drop our boundaries we allow false intimacy really to creep in and then when the world offers us this fantasy that we've been thinking about it can be even harder to say no so really a big tool for our mind is to once again learn to be content to stay present and that's such a biblical principle about deciding we don't even know what we're going to do tomorrow so let's think about today it has enough trouble of its own so it's that concept of one day at a time it's that concept of staying present I really want to look at a woman in the Bible who had a great mind change. We, I've been leading these Bible studies virtually of the bad girls of the Bible. And we've been taking a lot of encouragement from these bad girls because we can relate to them. And we can realize we all have sin. We all have trials. But we can look at them and we can be encouraged how to be different, to be better with God. So one of our favorite bad girls is the Samaritan woman. We find her in John chapter 4. And you may know the story, but Jesus goes to the well to get a drink, sees a Samaritan woman there, and has a conversation with her. And that alone would never have happened. A, a, a Jewish man would never talk to someone that's not related to them in, on the street, you know, at the well. A, a man would never talk to a woman. So we love that for Jesus who crossed all sorts of barriers just to share love and to show love. But we're going to pick it up in verse 13. It says, Jesus answered, uh, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Instead, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I don't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands and the man you have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. So here this woman is just going about her business. Women every day have to go to the well. We know she went by herself most likely at the hottest time of the day by herself because she was probably shamed by the other women because she's this woman who obviously has some type of sexual problem. She's been with five different men. The man she's living with now is not even her husband. She definitely would have been shunned by the other women. But, you know, we see the heart of Jesus sees her knows her, speaks to her, and really reveals her sin. And what does she do? Let's continue. She changes the subject. In verse um, 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. And I love Jesus here because 
she starts talking about worship. He's like, oh, okay, we're gonna talk about worship. Well, let's talk about it. He takes her where she's at and starts talking about worship. And he tells her, you know, my father wants worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. So he has this conversation, but she also has a mind change. And then we see if we jump down um, in verse 26, Jesus, or I'm sorry, verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. And what's great is this is the first time Jesus reveals himself as the Christ. And it's to a Samaritan woman, a woman living with a man who's not even her husband. And again, we see that he has a great heart. We see his love for this woman. She has an encounter with Christ. She leaves her jar at the well. She runs back to the town and exclaims to the town, I saw the Christ. He told me everything I've ever done. And we look down in verse 39. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. She's a great remarkable example of someone who encountered Christ was willing to have a conversation because she could have just said, oh, okay, well, have a nice day and leave. But she stood there, she allowed herself to be revealed and she realized who she was speaking to. She left her life, had a mind change, ran back to this town who probably thought of her, did not think very highly of her but yet was willing to share her testimony and people believed because of her and also believed because of Jesus himself we read about. And we don't know exactly what happened to her going forward, but I, when we get to heaven, that's who we see Jesus, great, where's the Samaritan woman? What happened to her? Because I, I just love this story about how she was used by God in such a powerful way. And that was pure power of pure mind changed. And she could have been defensive and she could have been shameful, full of shame, but instead she allowed Christ to change her heart and to be different. And I think of some of the sisters in my purity group who are full of shame, who actually are still encountering different men in the world and not even realizing quite yet that it's even wrong. But slowly but surely, I'm seeing the power of Christ in their lives and needing to have a full mind change to be able to say, I want to be different. I want to do the work. I want to start with my mind change and be able to leave their life and have a new life that helps them through the power of God and also in turn has helped other women. So I know that having our times with God every day, being content every day really brings on God's pure power. Amen. I really appreciate what Carol said, and I, I do want to, we said it earlier, but I want to echo it again. Uh, the things that we're talking about are for men and for women. Uh, sometimes I speak in a way where I'm just talking to the men because I'm used to talking to guys about this issue, but really this is a, this is a men and women's thing for all of us. Okay, um, but we've got to surrender to that idea of having a mindset of training. We're going to train. We cannot find the power of God without training ourselves. And training is challenging because it's a, it's a step by step. It's little steps ultimately lead to big transformation, but it can sometimes take a long, it can take a long time and it can be, it can just be difficult. It just takes some patience and some long-term thinking. So the second point is though, I want us to consider is embrace a training plan. So everyone needs a practical plan in order to find the power of God in a specific area of their lives. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. The Bible says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games does what? They go into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever, the purity of our hearts. Therefore, I don't run like someone aimlessly. 
I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body, make it my slave. So after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I so appreciate this here where Paul is illustrating that he doesn't run aimlessly. There's a focus. There's, there's thought behind the things that he's doing. In order to train to be a person to ultimately become pure by the power of God, we have to have a very specific plan or some type of, some type of plan. Uh, but Paul wanted to accomplish something. Finding God and his power is the fruit of dedicated effort. Concrete spiritual activities. People, don't, people get inspired to change, but they need a practical focus. Concrete spiritual activities that lead to transformation. Let me just give you a list of some of the elements of a good purity plan. I'm going to talk about them, a little, talk about them more in detail in a, in a minute. But just a list of the elements. A written recognition of why we're aiming for purity. Everybody has to know their why when they're going to dedicate themselves to something. Recovery work. Uh, This is where a a daily learning about purity, sexual purity, and yourself. Daily check-ins. A a personal connection with another person. A text is not a check-in. It's got to be some kind of phone call or meeting where you check in about what's going on in your life. Boundaries. Developing a whole set of boundaries which are lines in your life that if you don't cross them, or if you do cross the line, it's not necessarily sin, but your likelihood of getting into some kind of sexual sin goes way up. Like your, the, 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 uh, what is it? Like your odds, the odds of sinning go way up if you cross certain boundaries. Perhaps it's after 10 o'clock on the internet without a filter. Perhaps it's uh, driving to certain parts of town. Uh, perhaps it's engaging in conversations with certain types of people. Uh, Whatever it is, these are boundaries. Uh, Other practicals, weekly meetings, journal exercises, and a must is included in this is accountability. Uh, Somebody who's going to help make uh, your efforts significant. As a group leader, people often call me and they say, Tom, I need help with my purity. And I say, well, what do you you need help with? Or what, what makes you think? that you need to come to a purity group. And so we'll have a discussion and usually they have some kind of unwanted sexual behavior in their life or multiple ones and it's been going on for sometimes short time period of time, sometimes years, but they, they're like, gosh, something's, something's gotta change. I, I, gotta, I gotta get the help with the purity. So I'll get them to, I'll either get into a meeting with them or have them come to a purity meeting. And, uh, but they never leave that first meeting without a practical plan of what they're gonna do the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. Perhaps it would be similar to even our strategy of studying the Bible with people. We study the Bible with people, and then we give them an assignment, and then we follow up with the assignment. It's so important that people leave, or people have a practical plan in their lives of recovery activities, so that they can put that into practice in their training. Now, the activities have no power in and of themselves. It's really God who has the power. But people have to have something to sink themselves into. Um, I've had several people over the years just express gratitude for the fact that there's a practical plan. Some way for them to go into it. But nothing ever gets accomplished without a plan. Um, It's got to be thought through in advance. So we've got to have a mindset, I'm going to train. And then I've got to have a practical plan on what I'm going to train in and how I'm going to train and what I'm hoping to see happen. And then finally, the last thing is you've got to practice. Point number three is practice. In sports, athletes practice the fundamentals over and over and over again. And uh, this, these elements, the improvement in these elements leads to a great performance. In music, musicians do the same thing. Um, and they dedicate themselves to the practice so that they will perform well. But I would say equally important to the practice or to the performance uh, is practicing the fundamentals does something amazing on the inside of us. It provides understanding, it provides insight, and it creates wisdom somewhere deep inside of our souls. And a change on the inside that's provided by God 
is, begins to get reflected on the outside. The same is true spiritually. When we dedicate ourselves to the humble fundamentals of seeking God and a humble heart towards God, it changes us on the inside so we're all of a sudden, by God's power, able to say no to the temptations that in the past had had us enslaved. It's not us getting set free. Remember the, you know, who's going to rescue me from this body of death? It's going to be God. Now, let's go through that list of things to practice. I'm going to talk first about daily recovery work. This, is, this can be scriptures about purity. There's all kinds of books and resources out there on sexual purity that you can read and learn. As you read through chapters and you read from other people's insights, it begins to like start, it creates a spark on the inside. Learning creates a spark and it immediately helps us live more in the present. We, we want to actually put that into practice today. Whatever we learned, oh gosh, I want to, I want to practice that today. And daily recovery work. So, so people that ultimately find God's power are in the consistent business of training themselves in, an, in the area of purity, in their learning, and their learning about God. Uh, I love the scripture, Proverbs 19, 2. Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? When somebody realizes they have a problem and they say to themselves, I just got to be done. I'm going to go on a three-hour prayer walk. I'm going to cry. I'm going I'm to get serious here. I'm done. It's, uh, w- what you're doing is, but then you don't really learn anything and you don't dedicate yourself to educating yourself. Your feet are hasty and you miss the way. You just want the problem behind you. You don't really want to necessarily learn what God is wanting to teach you. The second thing is daily check-ins. This trains us. This is a phone call with another person, perhaps a meeting with another person, but it trains us in emotional honesty. How's your day? It's, it's more than, okay, good. How's, it, how's your day really going? How's work? How's your relationship with your boss? How's your relationship with your wife? How are these things going? There's, there's deeper questions to reveal what's going on inside your life. That's what a good check-in looks like. And over time, you develop relationship commitment as well as you develop friendship. So many people who struggle in this area struggle with their relational skills and their relational connectivity to others. And essentially, if, if you stay at this, you learn to love others. And even your check-ins are not just for you. Your check-ins are for the people that you're talking, talking with. But you develop emotional awareness, temptational awareness, you, self-awareness. It's an incredible blessing from God to be able to see yourself and to see yourself hum- humbly and honestly. Next thing is boundaries. I mentioned that. Proverbs chapter 5, I love how it's, how we, we read it yesterday, we read the big beginning of it yesterday. Solomon's solution for the adulterous woman was not have a quiet time and then go hang out at her house. Solomon's solution for the woman, or for the adult, for the temptations of sexual sin was stay far away. Get as far away as you possibly can. Uh, you're going to get sucked in if you get close. And what we want to do is is just develop some awareness of our lives. Remember, the sexual industry is constantly trying to find its way into your life, whether it's clickbait on ESPN, whether it's a billboard, whether it's it's somewhere out there, it's trying to find its way into your home and uh, into your heart. The next practical is, uh, and this is, it goes with the check-in, it goes with what we talk about in our meetings, it's practicing having a good attitude towards suffering. Uh, the Bible talks, strangely enough, very highly of suffering. Consider it pure joy when you suffer or rejoice in your suffering. Or in Hebrews 12, endure hardship as suffering. God is treating you as since he's being a father to you. And so we work with one another to train each other to have a great attitude about suffering. It is to admit it, to be honest, to even admit that we don't like it but to really develop a habit of, boy, God is in the difficulty here somewhere. And, and it's, a, it's an underlying just training that we do of one another. But it's so important to develop that spirit and that attitude. Typically, when suffering comes, we feel hurt. And then if we hate the suffering, it, just, it, we, it leads to the next step is compromise. And we justify all kinds of behaviors because we don't suffer well. And finally, the last one that I'm going to talk about this morning is accountability. I've got to have somebody who's sitting there, who takes, who's, who's like, okay, Tom, what did you do this week? 
How many recover? How many days did you really do recovery work? How many days did you check in? How are you doing with your boundaries? How are you doing with uh, just what you, what's going on in your life? Now, initially, this can see, maybe even seem onerous, but it's actually so important because it helps us actually have significance. I love accountability when I'm doing the things that I should be doing. Hey, it's great. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. The other person is inspired by the effort that I'm putting forth. Accountability is a wonderful thing. And then when I don't do the things that I should be doing, accountability is a wonderful thing because it helps me. Gosh, my problem is not really sexual sin. People's problem is not sex and sexual sin. People's problem is lack of really seeking God. And the fruit of it is being turned over to sin in some way in your life. Now, what makes these, power, these fundamentals so powerful? If you do them right, uh, they're all about dying to self and exalting God over ourselves. So you can look through that. You can find the humility in each one of those uh, practical, just to, to trust. Uh, it's one thing, I like the idea of thinking I'm humble before God, but the next level of that is being humble before other people. It's so important, such an important element to opening the door for God to work in my life. But they all lead to transformation, change and transformation and understanding of who God is and what God's purpose is for my life. I want to throw out a key concept here. It's called consistency over intensity. Uh, I, I don't know if I know anybody in the Houston church, but if anybody knew me 20 years ago, they would have called me Captain Intensity. I loved, I loved those messages and I loved getting fired up and I loved to, you know, just, I'm ready to run into a burning building. But it was, a, I, I loved intense emotions. I loved, I loved all the feeling. But the consistent work ethic, I really didn't understand and I lacked it in my own life. But when you start understanding this, the consistent work is what's powerful. It's not the intense emotion. It's not even being inspired. It's just consistently working at doing the will of God is where your power comes from. Everybody I've ever met that has struggled with sexual sin when they've come to me and they're looking for help, everyone I've met, they're in a place where they're not consistently engaged with God. For whatever reason, they've been derailed and they're in a place where they've lost hope and they've resigned to the fact that I guess this is just going to be the way it is. And uh, I do, I, I want to inspire you this morning. I encourage you that, boy, to dedicate yourself to consistency over intensity. Um, well, let's wrap up the lesson here. Brothers and sisters of Houston, if you or someone you know needs power from God in this area of unwanted sexual behaviors, the, make no mistake, the power's there. Everything you can do. I, I just 100% confident. Regardless of what your background has been, I've seen, I mean, I've seen it. I don't even have to have faith in the word, but I have faith in the word, but I've seen it person after person after person. When they begin to surrender and dedicate themselves to the right path, freedom just pops. It begins to have, you can hear the chains falling off in the spiritual world. Most come to grips with their powerlessness. Uh, but because of shame, this can be especially hard to do. Shame is a powerful enslaver where we just feel bad about ourselves. We feel ashamed of ourselves because of what we've participated in. But once you start getting open, and I really want to encourage you, find somebody you trust. If, if you have something hidden, find somebody you trust. Begin to have that conversation. Start talking and getting open. may even just be the tip of the iceberg, but start being open. It's the, it's the very first step in beginning to get to finding God's power. Adopt it, but once you get there, and once the, but once a few simple ideas open the gate to God's glorious power, then you accept a training mindset, get together a training plan, and practice the fundamentals rigorously. And then you're gonna leave, you're gonna find, a, find places with God that you never imagined. This morning as you leave, I, I really do, I'm really speaking to those people, first and foremost, who may feel desperate. I do, I urge you to find somebody to talk to and I just want you to know there's tons of hope. And then I'm speaking to those people that know people who struggle. I want you to understand that, boy, you can be a powerful influence for the good if you also get the vision and get the hope and share properly how somebody can recover.
And then for everybody else, I want you to know that we're a part of an amazing kingdom from God where there are solutions for all the things that the world gets enslaved to. In God's kingdom, uh, we, we get to see his amazing power work in our lives gloriously. Amen. Okay, so we've got some questions out here, out in uh, purity land. First question, you referenced how God allows you to be caught up in sexual sin, and how do you reconcile that with Paul and Romans talking about how we keep sinning even when we want to stop? Okay, the, uh, to, okay, Romans chapter one talks about when we fail to honor God, when we fail to bring him glory, he allows us he, he turns us over to the sin, the sinful desires of our heart. And uh, it's essentially, you can picture God at the center being the sun. And when we're headed towards the sun, the power source, there's power to overcome. Uh, but when we don't head correctly towards the power source, then God turns, allows us to go somewhere else. Instead of him being our number one desire, he allows us to have the desires that are in our heart. In the same way where Paul's like, hey, the good I want to do, that's a theological treatise where he's explaining why people have a problem with sin. Uh, their issue is that they're trying to deal with their sin on their own power. He's wrestling with his own willpower, trying to overcome sin on his own. And that's why he says at the very end, but praise be to God, there is, you know, Jesus Christ can rescue us from our sin. Uh, question number two, how do you help those that you shepherd that suffer from purity addiction while honoring confidentiality of members in the group? Some may not understand addiction versus lack of repentance. Are you, and I'm assuming that when you say some, you're talking about people within the church don't, but the people in the group understand, I, I think of our group or a purity group is perhaps just a deeper idea that addiction is a deeper level of repentance. There's a great, there's a greater problem inside, like our sin is really has us enslaved. And there's other theological concepts we have to internalize in order to finally break free and some other habits that we have to develop and build before God sets us free. Um, how do we deal with that? Well, ironically, I'm the minister of the church and uh, I'm also in our men's purity group. So it doesn't seem to present a problem. Uh, I do know that in other churches where groups have been started by people that don't have people in the ministry, the people that are leading the group do not confess anybody else's sin for them. So if somebody is open, let's say in a purity group about immorality, then what they can do, they can, I recommend if somebody's open in my group or I've heard about something like that, I recommend that people go and talk to their minister about it simply because their minister is the one who ultimately has responsibility for their soul before God. But a person has to choose to do that. If somebody's within the group and they're in regular immorality and they don't wanna be open about it, there perhaps there's other ways of dealing with it in the group where there's another problem. If they're not overcoming, something is wrong, uh, especially if they're choosing to continue in their hiding. Um, and I think to go along with that, just to add, I think sometimes you can offer to go with that person to speak with their elder or their minister, yeah. just so they know, um, yeah, this is serious and we, we need to confess it, um, but you can go with them as a friend. But yeah, we don't confess other people's sin. I think along the lines of confidentiality, people asked about non-members. We have had non-members and um, it, it's... The same as every time someone joins the group, the number one thing is, are you willing to be confidential? And everything that's said there stays there and who is even there stays there. So everyone's committed to that. And people have become disciples through these groups. Um, so yeah, non-members are also invited and everyone's the same. And, you know, I think once you get to this group, you're just at a place where I want to get help. So people are open and walk in the light. So it's really a great, um, it's like sometimes it's the best D groups of being vulnerable. Those groups can be very deep friends, have very deep friendships because of the vulnerability level. Great. What suggestions do you have for programs for filtering content on the internet? Uh, Covenant Eyes question mark. Covenant Eyes is one of my, is the one I recommend most for people. 
Uh, there's also a great accountability software on your phone called Ever Accountable. Uh, that's that's great. So anything any anything you search on your phone on Ever Accountable gets sent to an accountability partner. Uh, Covenant Eyes has both the accountability software as well as filtering software as well. Uh, they they all work. There's there's several out there. Um, and then there's one other one that's great for parents. It's called Custodio, 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 Q U S Studio, and uh, it gives information to the parents. Uh, you can actually control your kids' apps at what time they're going to be able to use them and shut them down. So if they're on Instagram or they're doing Snapchat, you can actually turn them on for from five to seven. If you like, like a t different time thing. Plus, you can even set it up to be able to see what they're talking about if you want to. Anyway, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Okay, in holding somebody accountable, is it better to ask them consistently or wait for them to confess? How do you balance letting them take responsibility and giving them a gentle nudge? Fantastic question. I think. Um, I think it's just you're working with somebody and you really get an idea of whether or not they're serious about wanting to deal with their own problem. One of the things that I find is when somebody's really ready to change, uh, that they become very willing to do the different types of exercises. They become very willing to do the little things that you need to do to start overcoming. And even perhaps the most important marker that somebody is really open to changing is that they will take somebody else's instruction and direction on how to recover. That they submit themselves, they, they realize for themselves, hey, if I knew how to get out of this, I would have gotten out of it a long time ago. Whoever, you, I don't even know who you are, but if you tell me this is how you do it, I'll do it. It's that kind of humility that opens the door. If you're in a situation where you're just, hey, always having to ask them, Obviously, they're not ready to change. They don't want to change. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, we ask, you know, hey, how's it going? How's it going with your purity? But it's definitely not my responsibility to worry about anybody else's openness. And then if they don't want to be open, then I don't spend a lot of time uh, ministering to them because that's really their issue. They've got to, hey, you got to go figure this thing out for yourself. So I think you know. another way, because um, this is a sin that could feel you know, we're used to hiding, not being open about it. So even when I start my group and we do our check-in, I'll say, this is a great time for any type of confessions, any defeat, any victories, but just to remind them, this is a time to confess. So I think a gentle nudge is, is good too. So there's a balance. Even with one-on-one -on -one times, I'll say, hey, is there anything you want to confess? Anything we can pray about together? And I'll try to lead also with confession. So just trying to, again, get that, um, you know, get that heart massage because it's so often it's hardened and we're trying to hide. So it is good. There's a balance there, I think. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, it is, do we have a, is there another one? Uh, wait, we got one more question here. And helping someone. No, that's uh, it. Oh, that's it. <laughs> I think okay. we got through the questions. Well, guys, it is, it is time for a break. Uh, thanks so much for the questions. And uh, guys, it is exciting. I mean, it is exciting to be in Wisconsin and share the day with people from Texas. Houston, yes. Believe it or not, I'm a Houston Rockets fan. Fear the beard. I've seen a Rockets game as well. Okay. Anyway, uh, enough of in that. In Houston. <laughs> enough of that. You know what? We're going to take a break, and then uh, Jason will put up the countdown, and we'll start our third and final video uh, when the countdown hits zero. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Hello everybody, uh, it's Tom and Carol again, and we're here for our class, Pure Families. And when we started the Purity Conferences, many people asked, what about our kids? How can we protect our kids from, and how can we set our kids up on a path of purity and try to avoid some of these things that we have fallen into ourselves? So this class is really important. Uh, once again, we have a 21 year old and a 17 year old. So this is something certainly we have had to navigate with our own kids. And we hope this class can benefit everyone else who listens. Amen.
Alrighty, uh, just a public service announcement also. I do love the Houston Rockets, so go Rockets in the playoffs. Although, by the time <laughs> you see this, they may be gone. Mm. Okay. Uh, anyway, a few years ago, on our anniversary, Carol and I went out to lunch, and then we went out for a hike. It was supposed to be a nine-tenths of a mile hike, and then we would end, it was at the state park, and we'd come back, and we'd buy ice cream. Well, it turned out I got us on the wrong path, and the hike ended up being six miles. By the time I figured out we were on the wrong path, it was exactly on the other side of the circle, three miles into the hike. Well, let's just say uh, it did not lead to that anniversary feel that I was hoping to create for, uh, for the day. Now, I was sincere, and I was walking vigorously, but because we were on the wrong path, uh, it ended up really being a challenging day. In fact, Carol ended up hurting her hip. She was limping into the parking lot. You can, I just, I was feeling like, oh, I felt about the same as I felt after the timeshare presentation. Uh, but many families are sincere and they're vigorous about wanting to help their kids have this great relationship with God and they want them to be on the right path. But it can really be confusing uh, as a parent, how do I help my kids? How do I really protect my kids? So the purpose of this class is to provide some wisdom for parents as they try to navigate our modern world, which has almost no standards at all whatsoever for sexual purity or sexual immorality. My first point today uh, in this lesson is to shatter denial. <clears throat> Blow it up. Just like you're throwing a brick through a window, shatter denial. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8-9, through 9, the Bible says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. You know, we can forget that our enemy is smart and ruthless. The enemy is Satan, and he looks at our children as someone to devour. Now, he wants them to become consumers of sexual sin, and not just as a teen, but consumers of sexual sin for a lifetime. He wants to destroy their innocence. The Bible tells us, be self-controlled and be alert, right? Not emotional, which is uh, where when we start getting emotional about these things, it really becomes about us. And it's not uh, we don't want to live in la-la land also, where we're just living, you know, pretending like everything's okay while our kids get attacked. I want to just share a quote, ironically, from the Department of Justice. It says, Never before, before in the history of media in the United States has so much indecent and obscene material been so easily accessible for so many minors in so many American homes with so few restrictions. Uh, it really has become our world today where indecent and obscene material is available for everybody. Uh, almost all children now are being exposed to pornography as in junior high or even earlier. There used to be stats by the time you're 18. Honestly, everybody I know now uh, is exposed to this stuff. And they're exposed young and they're exposed often. Uh, it's simply a way of life that we need to really understand and know how to battle. It is so important that we do shatter denial. And I know there has been um, instances where we can get into this trap thinking, oh, my kids would never do that. I remember there was a middle school ministry outing and word came back that this one boy was speaking very vulgar and sexual. And when we approached the mom um, about it, she said, oh no, my son's a good boy. He would never say anything like that. And to me, that's a scary place to be because no kid is above anything, but it also makes me think, is this boy gonna get help? Um, because if the mom is just gonna put her head in the sand and not bring this to light, you know, it's just gonna continue. Um, I think we just really have to be aware that nobody's above anything. You gotta always think about what were you doing in middle school, you know? And you always all, you know, just to remember again, no one is above anything. 
Another trap we can get into as parents is that we think, oh, we can't talk about this. Let's just not talk about it and it won't be there. We don't want to put thoughts in the kid's head, so we're not going to speak about sex or impurity or pornography, so it won't, it won't be an issue. And that, again, is really being in denial because it is there. And our, our kids have been, um, our, middle, our Midwest kids have been surveyed at church camp and they've pretty much all seen pornography by the time they were 10. And even if those kids didn't even have a cell phone yet, um, they would go to school and guess who has cell phones? Everyone else, and they're gonna be shown stuff, even those kids who do not, who do not wanna see stuff. It is the um, sad but true state of affairs. I remember back in um, when the kids, they rushed were maybe fifth, sixth grade, they were getting computers for everybody. In school, they were gonna sit at these computers. And I remember asking the principal, okay, so what kind of locks or guards or restrictions are gonna be on these computers? And the principal literally said, um, well, we we're not gonna have any of that. We just are gonna trust the character of the kids. And I really walked away and I was telling her that really, I trust nobody. I don't even trust my own kids. So we've gotta set our, our kids up for success. And we have to remember our kids are not Christians, they're not disciples, they're disciples in training. And some of them just aren't even interested in God at all, but either way, they're not mature enough. And with the peer pressure and all that, it's so simple for our kids to fall into this. So we just cannot be in denial. Um, the, th the three main things that really allow sexual sin to thrive are opportunity, which we know it's with those phones or anything else, the Chromebooks now our kids all have to do with virtual learning. Um, also secrecy that, you know, they could do with everything can happen right in their own bedrooms. You know, um, it's sec you could have secrecy and then affordability, you know, right from our kids phone or right from your home, even your Wii, your Wii gaming systems can streamline pornography as well for free. So these three um, op things really make it an, uh, make it very um, available to our kids. And we need to really um, not be paranoid, but also not be in denial. Amen. No, thank you, Carol. Uh, yeah, we need to be in reality. We need to be in the real world about these things that our kids are living in. And uh, I think, you now we're, we're getting older, but I think even the next generation of parents started to grow up in this world as well. Uh, so anyway, it's just, it's the, it's the very real world of uh, cyber, the, just the real world, of the online world around us. Point number two, resist him. Resist, the Bible says, and I'm going to repeat, I'm going to repeat verse nine here. It says, resist him standing firm in the faith, that there's a, there's a resistance that we're to have towards Satan and we're to stand firm in the faith because you know that your brothers and throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. You know, there's just a spirit when it comes to dealing with good and evil. There's a spirit of, of determination and strength that we're supposed to demonstrate. Even though our power does not come from our own determination, our power comes from God. But there's a determination that we're to exhibit as sons and daughters of God and as parents of our children. Uh, before our kids learn to resist, they need to see their parents resist. It's so important that we sit, create a culture of purity within the house. So if things come on the TV, we change the channel. Uh, that we're very careful about what we watch and even how we go through a process of choosing a movie or choosing our entertainment. That what our kids will pick up on, they'll pick up on our hearts about the whole thing. If we kind of, if we want to compromise a little bit, they'll they'll learn. They'll literally learn the spirit of compromise. Uh, they also need to see our determination to fight for them. Uh, I had a brother come to me one time and he, he, he shared with me, he's like, oh, I'm really bummed out. And I said, why? He said, my mother, I told her not to get my kids an iPad for Christmas, but she bought him an iPad anyway. And uh, I said, oh my God. And his kids were, uh, one was in junior high school, one was, I think, a freshman or sophomore in high school. And I said, wait, wait, I mean, you can, you don't have to let them have those iPads or you can restrict those iPads. And he said, well, you know, I mean, they, they got them and they were so excited. And he was really making excuses for not wanting to get involved in dealing with his children with their uh, devices. Um, and then he even made the comment that, oh, well, they're gonna look at this stuff uh, in other places. 
But the point in the matter, and we had a great discussion, and he really did. He changed on the spot, and he, he, he went, and he dealt with his kids and did a great job with them. But what I, what I tried to help him understand is that, boy, our kids have to see us take a stand. They have to see us really battling to protect them from the Internet world. Remember I mentioned earlier about the sex industry and its, its attempt and intention run by Satan. His intent and intention is to capture the hearts of our children. And what our kids need to see is they need to see our fight to try to protect them from that. The answer, the, the truth of the matter is, yeah, you can go and your kids are going to find these things or they're going to be, they're going to see these things from other people at times. But when they see your willing participation in trying to protect them, it creates that love and that creates that care inside of them. Uh, there was a cool quote in the movie. It's actually American Sniper. It's about Chris Kyle. I, I believe he's from Texas, in fact. Uh, but he said there's three kinds of people. There's sheep, there's wolves, and there's sheepdogs. And the idea is that the sheep are the innocent ones and the wolves prey on the sheep. But there are people who are sheepdogs who protect the sheep. For us, we, we need to be the sheepdogs for our kids. Uh, we have to be strong. to have determined minds to really be in there to protect our kids. A couple practicals here. Uh, number one, just reminding our kids of the standard of God, but also to really have conversations where we share the why, to really try to have these conversations. We've had conversations with our own kids about these things on many occasions, uh, but just the whole idea that if you start looking at pornography and you get involved with these things, it begins to deaden your heart towards God. Nobody looks at pornography and thinks, oh yeah, gosh, it's a great time to have a prayer time. Or to even, it's, it's so selfish and, and it has such a d damaging effect on your conscience that, uh, boy, you, you want to explain that, gosh, the, the reason we want you to avoid these things is because of the effect that it's going to have on your heart. It also causes people, to, it also will cause your kids to see people as objects both men and women, you'll see them as sex objects, objects of your pleasure. Again, it's incredibly self-centered in the way it shapes your perspective. And finally, it's going to have lasting damage on the glorious plan that God has for your sex life within the context of Christian marriage. Sex is a wonderful thing. It's a God-given thing. God has great plans for us and our sex life. It's one of the reasons that the, the world of evil is on the hunt to destroy it because it's such a wonderful thing to be experienced. But to explain to our kids, hey, if you, if you don't take care of this area of your life, it's going to have lasting impact on all that God had planned for you. The second practical is to know all the access points in the house, as Carol mentioned. you got to know the gaming. So absolutely, there's all kinds of little ways that, um, that the Internet can be accessed uh, through computers, games, phones, everything. And finally, if you do have sin and you do have incidents, confront that sin. In Galatians 6, verse 1, the Bible says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. So if there is some kind of incident with your kids, talk to them about it. Get involved. Don't overreact. But, but get in there. Restore them gently. Talk to them. Try to turn it into a learning experience instead of a shaming experience. So the challenge is, don't be passive, but resist the evil one. Point number three, stay connected. In Ephesians 5, verse 1 through 2, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know, God's way of rescuing us from a sinful world is to love us, to get our attention, to help us know his goodness, and we repent of some sin, but really what we repent of is this narrow, thin, little, shallow thing. We repent, and we get baptized, and we become part of the family. God knows about all the sin and all the deep things underneath, and he's going to spend a lifetime redeeming us, helping us learn to obey. But it's, so, it's really important to remember that our connection with our children, like God's connection with us, is the first priority. Obedience comes over time, but we need to stay connected. And I want to talk a little bit about the parent-kid connection, and it is fragile. It is easily broken, right? Trust can easily be broken. It's 
like a cell phone call being dropped. It could just be boom. It can be uh, disconnected. Yeah, our, our relationships, our connections with our kids requires regular maintenance. Um, it's under an, a daily assault from Satan. And I know that's why that dinner table is so important, even with our older kids. Like today we had dinner on the porch, dinner on the deck, but they, you know, we come together. We made it a special time. You know, we'd pick up the kids from school and they would be like, I'm gonna, I have something to share at dinner. And they wouldn't want to share it. They wanted to save it. You know, we just made that a special time. It was always a connection. Always a connection. Um, also, it's vital. This connection is super vital. Things are passed down through that relationship. Our love of Christ, our hope, our faith, our peace. You know, we want to live the life of dearly loved children and pass that down. So like the scripture said, you know, we want to take the example of Christ pass it down to our kids. And we're always thinking what's best for the kids, right? We wanna always be nurturing and getting them ready to be launched out into the world. But so what does this practically mean? I think first is pray. You know, make sure you're praying for your kids every day. Um, you know, pray that sin does get revealed so you can deal with it, you can talk about it. Um, model the right attitudes about sin, about your own sin. You know, do we apologize when we blow up or do we apologize for any bad attitudes? Um, are our kids witnessing us gossiping or whatever it is or fighting with our spouse? That we're being um, humble, we're apologizing. You know, it's interesting, my kids, th the other day, um, when they make their bed, they take their little throw blanket and they put it on an angle, which I have done in my bed the whole time. So my daughter moves to Seattle and she's still doing it. And she's like, mom, we're always watching you. You know, she's 21, but that's a great reminder. Your kids are always watching you. Um, so they, are you modeling getting advice, getting discipled? Mm -hmm. You know, there was times that our kids would come to us, ask questions, or maybe they wanted something very expensive, whether it's a pair of shoes or something. And we would say, we're going to get advice on that. And they'd be like, okay. We're, and then we'll, we'll say, well, we'll come back and tell you how it went. Great. So they would see us get discipled. Um, they were free to call our discipler. And one time our son did call our disciplers. And the next day, we all were in a family meeting in the front of the room. And, but it was great that they knew they had another place to go. If they weren't getting like it was our son, my son getting not getting along with me. So we all were together with our disciplers and it went great. But we wanted to always model that, that you always can ask for help. So um, also is guarding that connection. Really important. Um, learning how to resolve conflict. And it's going to be there. Even in, I mean, we've had that in our relationships. We've, we, anyone could call a family meeting and then we talk about it. Um, you know, as they get older, it's different things. But we always want to make sure everybody in the house, we're the newly four. We want to make sure the four of us are always doing well. Um, and again, learning to admit sin. And what I really want to talk about is not overreacting mm. when your kids come to you or when you find out they like someone at school. We never want to overreact. It literally could take one overreaction and all of a sudden they know, oops, mom's not safe or oops, mom got really upset. I can't go to her. She's not safe. And that door will be shut and they won't come back to you. So that's why we don't want to overreact. You know, they're going to be afraid that you're going to show up at school or you're going to yell at someone or you're going to get emotional. We don't want to overreact. I think about a time where we found out um, our, seventh, our daughter was in seventh grade and she started spending a lot of time with a boy across the street. Of course, in groups, they would walk home together by themselves. Well, I was wondering why she didn't want to uh, pick up after school anymore, she was going to walk home. So I'm like, oh, well, that they started building a friendship. And then it became, I think she likes him. And we're like, okay. So I remember we just kind of got advice, what we should do. And then we were, she came into our bedroom one time and Tom just kind of playing guitar. So Tom's asking, so why do you like him? She's like, oh, he's nice and he's funny, you know, and I'm just like sitting listening. And then I say, oh, does he go to church? And she's like, no, he's an atheist. And I'm like, watch your face. I'm like, just trying to go, okay, okay. And not overreacting. And so um, 
You know, just, just one example I can think of. Because had I said, you can't like him. He doesn't even go to church. He doesn't even know God. What are you thinking? Is that what you want? Is that what you want in a marriage? You know, can you imagine if I went there and she's in seventh grade? She would think, yeah, I, I can't talk to mom about that. Instead, we would establish conversations even before this. Oh, are, are you liking anybody at school? How's it going? And I would say, you know, Joy, I remember what it was like to be in seventh grade. I remember, right? So you have to tell them that. And then I remember Joy even thinking, wow, I never think of you as that. I just think of you as mom. And especially we're disciples and we're church leaders. So there's a lot of pressure for our kids, for any ministry kids and any disciple kid, right? So we want to make sure that we've got this communication and we're not overreacting and that we're really, um, we're ready for small stuff so we can handle the big stuff, right? The small stuff is who they're crushing on at school or at church camp, you know, that's small stuff. The big stuff is, yeah, gosh, if there's a situation, um, doing stuff behind your back, getting with other people, you know, sexually, you know, looking at pornography is starting a real addiction of not being able to stop um, or drugs and alcohol. You know, we're in a pandemic. Everything has been um, tripled. The opiate usage for one, it's just our kids are going through a lot. We have to always be a safe place. That is the most important thing. I know I've even had to put, you know, our relationship is more important than grades, than schooling. If they, it's better that I'm tight with my kids and they could fail a class versus me get on a certain situation, making sure the homework gets in, homework gets in, and it damage our relationship. Just another example that I'm always putting my relationship above anything else. It's so very important because they got to know that they're loved by us. So oh, just today over lunch, I surveyed my two kids and I asked them, what do you think I should tell these parents about protecting their kids' purity? And just to remind you, my daughter's 21 and she's a disciple and my son is 17. And he's not a disciple and they grew up in the church and going to church camps and being in public schools. So they are well versed in all this stuff. And so here's a couple of things they said. Be sure to have hard talks. Tell them there are consequences to seeing the pornography. There's consequences to starting masturbation. They shouldn't go to school and learn about this there. They should know about pornography on your phone. They should know about um, all the stuff that's going on. So it's real, it's going on, and establish this before they go to school. So that's established as normal, um, not that it's, we know it's simple, but that's where as authority, as the parents, you can establish that. And so they hear that, oh, mom and dad said that, <clears throat> this is not good. Um, watch the movies you watch as a family. You know, they were saying all these little things add up and how they would be at someone else's house and they'd watch a movie that was inappropriate. They'd feel awkward. And I would be surprised to find out this disciple home was watching these certain movies. So just to remember, what are you watching? Your kids are watching. Um, be aware of all the social media. You know, if your kid goes on Facebook, which they have to be 13 before they go on, um, you should be on. You know, try to be on as much as you can. Um, you should be aware of what's going on. Be out there. See what's happening. Create an open environment that will help you with purity. You know, share your own stuff, it, if appropriate. Certainly say, I struggle with pornography. I struggle with ungodly, impure relationships growing up. Let them know that. Um, what they did say, you shouldn't say things like, you better not be on TikTok, but it ex help them understand why. What is so bad about TikTok? What's happening in TikTok? You know, just last night after prayer night, two of our single sisters were sharing a dance from TikTok. How does a little kid who hears that going to say, oh, well, they're on TikTok. How can I not be on it? Explain it. A lot of conversations. Um, because they said, if you say that, their friends will just get them on TikTok anyway. So be sure, you know, have conversations. Don't just lay down rules without explaining the why. Um, also, don't be scared or judgmental uh, when they come to you saying, can I share about this? Can I share about something that's happening at school? Don't be scared. Don't be judgmental. I know when things happen at school, they knew I would not call the principal unless I got their permission to do so because there'd be inappropriate stuff going on, whether it's computers or whatever. I would say, is it okay if I tell the principal this one? Can I try to do it anonymously? I always made sure I had, they, you know, we could be in it as a team. They weren't worried. I'm going to be 
um, crazy mom at the school. And also, again, don't be scared. Don't overact. Um, just be very, um, just be willing to listen. Um, and basically, and then one of um, my daughter said, assume the worst and foster an open environment. And basically, everyone struggles with sexual <laughs> sin. The girls, too. My daughter wanted to make sure. It's impossible not to, they said. Um, that absolutely everyone that they know at camp or they said the Bible with, everyone has this in their past. And these are our kingdom kids. These are our kids. So, again, not being in denial, but being open to talk about it. And then, too, to have older mentors, like a campus student or someone else, you might not be the person that they want to be open with. But that's okay. The good news is they want to be open with someone. And we know you shed light on this stuff, and the truth will set you free. So um, we are praying for all of our kids to make great choices. Amen. Amen. Awesome. No, I really, uh, uh, I wanted to add to that, you know, when Carol said, don't overreact. You know what we do? We overreact privately, but don't <laughs> yes. overreact when we talk to the kids. So when uh, Carol was talking about this boy walking Joy home, uh, I remember like, what? What are they on a date? What the heck is going on around here? And then uh, kind of talk each other off the ledge so that then when we actually talk to our kids, we're able to have conversations where, you know, we, we get our feelings out elsewhere so that we can come in with a great, uh, just great attitude. Okay, so challenge, guard your connection with your kids. It's both vital and it's fragile. Finally, let's, let's uh, go, to, go to our last point. Simply wisdom protects. Uh, though it costs everything you have, get wisdom, right? Try to understand, try to understand where your kids are coming from and what they're going through. It's totally different than the growing up that we had. I mean, some of it's similar, but then a lot of it's different. It's very different how they build relationships, how they see sex, everything. Uh, Proverbs 14, 26 says, Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. Remember, you can't underestimate your dedication to God serves as a protection for your children, that they'll always know where the right thing is, even if they're in a time of rebellion. And uh, without confessing any of our family sins, let's just say we're equipped to be able to give this lesson. Amen? Uh, but here's a, couple, here's a couple ways that wisdom protects. The first thing is, and we've said it, we've said it several times in this lesson, I'm going to say it again because uh, it's just a very important component of a, of a parent in this world. Be aware of the online world. Understand what Instagram is. Understand what they're looking at on Instagram. Understand what cyberbullying is, sexting is, predator chat rooms. All kind, there's all kinds of stuff. Just a whole dark world out there. You don't want to watch it yourself, but you really want to know about it and be able to talk to your kids about it. Second thing is fight to protect all your devices. I remember one time we got these our kids these little Nintendo devices and uh, Joy figured out how to get online and then she got her son online. I mean, literally our kids are online on their little devices and then you realize they have, they can, they can Google from these little devices. Anyway, you gotta know these things and you gotta find a way to try to deal with this kind of access. There's all kinds of tools, all kinds of filters out there. Uh, uh, accountability software tells you what, they're, what somebody's doing on the internet. A filter prevents people from going to certain places. I'm guessing that somewhere in the Houston church people know about these things. Usually a lot more people know about these things today. Uh, Covenant Eyes is something that we used for our family. But there's all different kinds. And Custodio, that was really pretty slick. It would tell you who they're texting and you could turn off certain apps at certain times. You could turn off Instagram at certain points. And, uh, but there's a lot of tools out there. Again, pursue wisdom. Find out what's out there. Find out what you can do. Uh, and it's, a, it's all in the effort to love your kids. Um, talk to your kids. Ask them questions. Uh, Carol mentioned get advice from other people. Just talk about this stuff. Don't be afraid. Don't be, I, it's an awkward topic. It's uncomfortable. Just feel great. Here's, here's some great questions that I know I've asked our kids at different times. In what ways am I naive about sexual sin that you're exposed to? Well, how am I naive? Let me let me in on the on the study here, or on the get, on get, I want to get the skinny. Uh, how am I doing about being real and humble with my own sins and my own vulnerability? 
how do you feel like uh, you can be open about, or how do you feel like you can be open, I'll ask them, about their sexual purity challenges? And then why or why not? Can, do you feel like you can be open? Why or why not? Maybe not with us. Do you have other people that you can talk with? But it's, it's really honest, investigative questions uh, that, that we want to be able to have, have this kind of communication. And again, it's awkward. So sometimes you ask these questions, hey, how am I naive? Yeah. Like you, you, you don't get a lot of feedback, but you keep asking, you keep talking, you keep trying. Our kids are always our kids. It's just part of the love that we give to them. Uh, number four, deal with problems when God reveals them. So Carol mentioned it earlier, we pray that the sin gets revealed, and boy, we've had some sin revealed over the years. God, God really does answer those prayers. And when they come out, just as I mentioned earlier, you who are spiritual, restore them gently. Uh, talk it through, how did it get started, how long has this been going on, where are the places you've gotten access. Try to, try to find out. Your, we want to learn and be great students of our kids so that we can know how to help them best. And then finally, the last thing is to teach your children, if you can, to be leaders. Remember what ultimately protects our kids. It's not us. We can't, we can't run around and protect our kids from the evils of the world. What we try to do, rather, is we try to help them become students of wisdom so that they're protected from the inside out, so that they start making choices that are that protect they they understand what's going on they understand how they're a target they understand to take responsibility and they understand uh to to protect themselves and then on top of that they begin to share with other people boy once a person we know this as a christian once a person is in that place where they feel compelled to want to help and teach other people boy you're in a great place spiritually and that's our, that's our goal with our kids, is to help them be leaders in these things that they would be able to understand so that they would be able to minister to others. As we wrap it up today, I wanted to have a great anniversary. It got derailed because I lacked the wisdom and I didn't read the map correctly. I thought I knew what I was doing. I'm confident everybody here wants what's best for their children. Uh, and they want their kids to be able to deal with this world that we're living in and be successful at it. But let these ideas sink in. Say goodbye to denial. Just say, okay, gosh, we've got to live in the real world of what's going on and how our kids are under attack. Resist vigorously. Not controlling, but vigorous, but where we have our convictions. And we want to pass on that teaching as best we can. And then uh, also guard your connection. It's such a fragile thing to stay connected to your kids on a consistent basis. And then finally, just wisdom protects. Let's be students of wisdom. Let's keep learning. Let's do everything we possibly can to set our kids up for success. And in the end, it's God that makes things fly. Brothers and sisters of the Houston Church, it's been wonderful to spend some time with you. Have a fantastic day. Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> um, Super appreciate everybody just uh, spending time with us today. And uh, anyway, it's great to be able to chat a little bit with you out in Houston. And we wish we were there with you, but this is probably second best option. Sure. But well, one day the pandemic will end. We'll have to go to Texas. Uh, okay, first question. When do you recommend parents seek professional help for purity issues with kids? Church groups may not be equipped with professional counselors to stop the brain rewiring. Uh, great, great question. Boy, I, oh, gosh, Carol, do you have any thoughts on that? I think let's use every tool at our disposal. And if, if you can get counseling, I think that's great. You could certainly ask your, um, your child, hey, do you want to talk to someone about this? Because um, oftentimes they don't feel good themselves. They don't. They want to stop, and they feel like they can't. So you could simply say, "Is there someone in the church you want to talk to? Do you want to go to a counselor? Do you want to do a specialist? Um, um, that sort of thing." Sometimes, if you're insurance, you have insurance, and so you have a certain counseling group within your insurance. I know we've been through that. And what I have done, I will call and just say, you know, because you don't want to maybe pay out of pocket for a Christian counselor, um, which we've done that too, like through Disciples Today, 
course, Tom is now a coach. You can get um, coaching. Um, but also, I have called our insurance company and I had said, I want to be with a counselor who's got a Christian worldview. And I said, is that appropriate to ask? And they're like, absolutely. So it's not that I was looking, it didn't necessarily have to be a disciple, but someone who I knew wouldn't take, you know, um, our kid off the path of God, so to speak. So that was something we had done. We had gotten counseling. Um, and, you know, I think for anything, counseling is that why not? You know, and I think he came back thinking, ah, you know, I got guys in the church who are probably just as better because they know me, they talk back. A lot of times it just depends on who you connect with. But yeah, I would say go for it. Why not? And I, I also think when you say kids, there's the question of how old. Uh, so I've, I've known kids who've been exposed and even like began to have an addiction as young as nine or 10 years old. And uh, uh, you, you really can't go to a group for something like that. Uh, the kids are just too young. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, those are, when you're young like that, a, a group is really not appropriate yet. They're just not mature enough. Um, so yeah, I'm with Carol. Not afraid of professional help, but remember, you're the one in charge of who helps your child. Um, okay, my son was exposed to sexual content by a classmate in third grade. I overreacted. How do you build a safe environment? Uh, or how do you rebuild a safe environment? I'm guessing maybe what you're asking is how do you rebuild the trust between your son and you based on your overreacting? Uh, I think even as young as third grade, you can admit, hey, I, I completely overreacted. You also want to, you perhaps even ask yourself the question, why did you overreact? I, sometimes our go-to to protect our children is to think that we have to shelter them from everything. We do want to shelter them, but what really protects them in the end is their wisdom. Uh, is that they would understand themselves what the fight is, what the fight is all about, why they should, you know, what what is the potential uh, problems with it. But you can you can own your part and change to be more of a coach where you help them understand why it's so important, and uh, and then also explain how you would like to see the relationship going forward. Hey, I, even to explain to your kids that I would like to be somebody that you trust. If you get exposed to things, that you would talk to me because you understand uh, just how harmful this is going to be to your future sex life. Um, so they're going to, if what they want to do is see and participate in these things, they can see and participate them. Nowadays, even with our mega efforts to try to lock everything down, there's ways that they can find and participate in these things if they want to. I think just to add to the overreaction, I think building safety and faith and trust in every area, um, you know, I overreacted a little bit with the COVID thing, the anxiety and that, you know, had <laughs> My son had some real feelings about the way I responded to a COVID situation here. So I'm like, okay, it's always a call hire. Uh, we have to remain calm, but I think you can get that back. I think by ask, you know, apologizing for overreacting, saying I want to be different, and you know, and then asking questions, how's it going at school, and just showing or um, showing to be, you know, a very calm presence and just asking, how's your, do you want, you know, you can even ask your child, do you want me to check in on how your purity is going? They might say, yeah. So then you just calmly, no matter what they say, it's like, all right, thanks for sharing. I'll pray for you. Do you want to read scriptures? Do you want to read a book? You know, and I think just more, just kind of letting them know that here on out, you're being different and you're learning too. And that's simply what you can say. You love, I love you so much. I didn't want to see this happen. And I'm sorry, I first responded really emotionally, but I just want to be a partner in you really on the being on the right path. And you, this goes on along, this kind of goes to the next question. Um, teen daughters, not interested in God and they want to dress in ways that are not appropriate. Yeah, that is, a, that's a challenge. Um, I think, we can make it not about God, but about just being respectable. Help, I think our ladies understand when you are dressing that way, 
um, are, you know, maybe asking why, um, maybe ask, letting them know, you know, guys are very visual. Men are looking at you. I want them to see your heart. I want them to see who you are and not your body. Um, it's very challenging. And I know, you know, having my daughter growing up, like the shorts are so short and my daughter's super tall. And so sometimes, you know, she'd be like, that's how boys wear their shorts, the long, you know, it's, it is hard and how to find, um, a good balance. But I think what's most important here is your relationship. And sometimes um, they themselves will make those decisions and you just got to pray God, let, let, you know, and not, and not be too overbearing in that area as well. Um, and it is hard, like I said, but I think help them under, help them maybe look at women who we respect as people um, and see, look how she's dressing. Who is someone that you respect that still looks good, still looks modern, um, still looks fashionable, but that, um, you know, is covered appropriately. So maybe looking for some role models and uh, that sort of thing. But yeah, that's, that's a challenge. It's just a challenge. Okay. Next question. Thanks, Carol. Uh, I'm the only disciple in my family. How can I help siblings who are not disciples understand that impurity is wrong? They are surrounded by people that tell them it's okay. Um, I think whenever you're talking to people that are non-Christians, what you want to do is you want to have conversation as opposed to uh, getting into a debate about what's right and what's not right. For me, that, and I've mentioned it a couple times even in our, our Q&A here, what's most important to me is like why was sex created in the first place? And that it gives you, like at least it gives us a reason for why we're being pure, other than simply because the Bible says for us to be pure, which is a great reason in and of itself, but the idea that God has something much greater planned for it. Uh, if they were to ask, or if you were just able to have some kind of dialogue where you can, where you can talk and you can find out why, because so often, even though the world says that it's okay, when you participate in things that are impure, even if you've done it a lot and your heart is hard, there's still the ability to feel a little bit of conscience behind it. Um, I, I've known people who have just who've been in this for long stretches of time, but they still feel a little bit of guilt and shame in the back of their heart. And so to ask, you know, even to ask those kinds of questions, do you really feel good? There, it feels good, but do you really feel good about yourself when you participate in these things? And one last thought on that idea. Uh, I do do this thing where we, we deal with people who purchase sex. Purchase sex. Uh, it's, a, it's a volunteer program where we work with people, deal with the guys who purchase sex. We actually have conversations with these guys. It's a, it's a, it's a long story. It's something that I'm part, part of. All these guys, if you can get them into a conversation, there's reasons why they're going to it. Uh, and they don't realize what they're participating in. The sex industry in our country is, is really an awful thing to participate. So you might let them know, hey, there's, there's 28 billion visits to one website alone, which is Pornhub, every year. That's uh, four times for every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. That's how much just that one website is being visited. But to help them take a look at the sex industry and realize that fuels things like sex trafficking. That fuels things like rape. It fuels things like abortion. And then when you participate in these things, you're actually a participation in a giant, um, you know, just a, a giant negative direction of humanity. So. And I think to even, um, yeah, model and have maybe conversations. What do you want your life to be like? Um, there are books written and I was just trying to Google. It's always scary to Google certain things, obviously, but just the whole hookup culture um, where what it does to our brains as women, especially, but everyone, it was never meant to be that way. So even if we're not thinking about God, um, even what it does to us emotionally, of course, physically, when we are being impure and moral, and um, we just are going to end up with broken hearts, broken dreams, a lot of disorders, um, codependency. There's a lot of things that the impure negative, nature, negative consequences, negative consequences. So I think even 
painting the picture of where we, where do you as a sibling, where do you as my child want to end up? You know, do you want to get taken off track or down that path? Of, or do you want to have a, the, be on the path of character and have a successful, healthy relationships? I think frame it that way is sometimes helpful too. And going along those lines, I just want to mention um, when you talked about in third grade, the question, um, you know, we didn't talk really about sleepovers. So within my purity groups, um, within talking to women, oftentimes these sleepovers are where a lot of the sin people do get exposed. Um, that, that is something to really be cautious about. And, you know, you hate to be that parent who, well, I'm going to pick you up. And we were those parents. You can stay all night at the party, but we're picking you up at midnight or whatever. You know, we didn't care what time, but, you know, just to try to avoid. Um, and our kids only slept over at just a couple people's homes in the church. Because remember, they're not disciples. Our kids are kids. And, you know, I know what I was doing at those sleepovers, right? And so... <laughs> not being good even though one time we did call about 10 pizza places to go to their neighbor's house um, we well we did those dumb things too but you know calling boys looking at porn that that's what's happening at sleepovers sometimes i'm not trying to make us paranoid either we have to be balanced but just to say be cautious that i always felt like we've got one chance to get our kids um to grow up and do their best. And so give them that vision of what life could be um, when we do it in a great character, respectful way. Amen. Well, we have Ronnie back. Connecting the audio. Should, oh, we got a moment here. Should I tell dad jokes? Oh, yeah. no, Ronnie came through. Right. Is there any other questions? Did we look? Any other no, questions? No, that's okay. it. Okay. That was our last question. Great questions, everyone. We feel honored to have been here with you all in yeah. Houston. Hey, Amen. <clears throat> Tom and Carol, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say the class was awesome. Uh, and for those in Houston, you know, I know some of you joined late. Uh, some of you guys had to leave, come back. Uh, the class is recorded. And uh, we will have it up on the website soon. So we'll, we'll send a notice to let you guys know. But honestly, this is one of the best classes on purity I've been to. I've been to a lot. You guys gave a lot of practicals. And um, I can remember the time my wife and I also, you know, we've got kids that are grown now, one married. But we also, you know, had to stay calm and cool and collective. But we did have our moments <laughs> with ourselves. <laughs> but uh, very excellent um, advice. We really appreciate it. Uh, and really appreciate you guys uh, just, just really helping us out. For those watching, I want to give a good shout out to Jason. You know, technology is awesome. You know, the newlies are in Wisconsin. Jason is in Tennessee. And uh, we're here in the great state of Texas. So uh, All right. it's great to be able to kind of connect. Um, at this point, I just really want to end and I want to thank you again uh, on really behalf of the staff of our Greater Houston Church, uh, the other elders. We really, really appreciate uh, you all just really sharing your lives. Um, again, I want to remind those, you know, go on the website, get their uh, web address and uh, reach out to them. Uh, I think they'll be a great source of uh, just really knowledge. And maybe we can start some of those groups here in Houston. Uh, with that, why don't we end in a prayer and then we'll close out today. Okay, let's pray. Father God, thank you again just for the opportunity to uh, connect with brothers and sisters literally uh, around the country. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity. Uh, please bless the newlies in this, their effort to really just help your people uh, to really get closer to you, uh, to fight Satan, uh, and, and really to help us to really uh, create uh, 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 communities that you've always wanted us to create as far as really helping each other through your word. Father, we pray all of these things in your son's name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. All righty, guys. See you later, Houston. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>